Hello and welcome to it. You're watching Hashtag Africa. In the next 15 minutes, we'll be taking a comprehensive look at stories that dominated headlines across the continent. I'm Duduzile Ramela. Africa is mourning the loss of one of its greatest daughters, Umamowini Matikizela Mandela. She died in a Johannesburg hospital at the age of 81 this past week. She'll be fondly remembered for the role she played in South Africa's struggle for freedom. Kenya's Uhuru Kenyatta, Ghana's Nana Akufo Ado, and Umama Grasa Michelle are among a few who have expressed sadness at her passing. The Zimbabwean parliament will also honor the late struggle icon. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has backed out of a deal with the UN to give residency to thousands of African migrants. Hours after entering into the deal, Netanyahu suspended it, saying he was responding to the outcry from members of his conservative Likud party. The more than 15,000 migrants will now be resettled to Western nations. And Rwanda will neither fight nor appeal the United States' decision to suspend the country's duty-free access to the country's imports. The move has been widely seen as an attack on the East African nation after it refused to lower trade barriers for American-made clothes and shoes. The suspension applies to all AGOA-eligible apparel products from Rwanda. Now, thousands of Ghanaians took to the streets of Accra this week in protest of a controversial defense cooperation deal the country entered into with the United States. It's widely reported that the deal would give the U.S. military unrestricted access to Ghana's facilities, including the country's radio channels. The U.S. will invest about $20 million in equipment and training for the Ghanaian military. Now, this week, we look at the increasing military role of the United States and ask how beneficial it is to the continent. I'm joined in studio by Dr. John Stremlau from the Department of International Relations at Wits University. Always a great pleasure chatting to you, John. You. What f footprint um, does the U.S. military have on the continent and what are they doing here? Perhaps let's start with a bit of context. Well, the U.S. policy toward Africa has become militarized and I think that is a subject of concern. But it's also true that the civilian leadership, namely Donald Trump, has articulated no African policy, showed very little interest, in fact, bigoted comments about Africa, has no assistant secretary of state for Africa, has no ambassador in South Africa, for heaven's sake. So you have the military carrying on with its programs. It has programs in about 54 African countries and about 7,200 troops, according to the head of AFRICOM, General uh, Thomas Waldheiser, who gave testimony last week on the Hill and was questioned about these programs, like the Ghanaian one that mm -hmm. you mentioned, or across the, 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 the five Sahelian joint force countries of instability and terrorism. And it's a counterterrorism program, but it's also a capacity building program. But it needs diplomacy. It needs foreign policy. It needs African partners. Right. Let's hone in on Ghana specifically. It's a pretty stable country. So what is this deal essentially about? Well, it's a very stable country with a very lively and partisan domestic politics. And I think this whole issue of the treaty, which is an extension of arrangements that have been made with African and West African countries for military assistance and training as part of the ECOWAS capacity building effort and linked in part to the uh, group of five Sahelian joint force that's above Ghana. But that whole area is afflicted with uh, forces of crime, forces of terrorism, forces of population movements. Ghana is a jewel, but the countries to the north, as you know, are very troubled. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the G5 Sahel Force that you just mentioned. I mean, a lot of questions coming up in terms of funding of the force as well, uh, as who is behind all of that. Help us make sense of their role on the continent as well. Well, the African Union's um, uh, Commission on Peace and Security met on the 23rd of March and endorsed the extension of this uh, Group of Five joint military force, which is the Sahelian countries of Mali and of Burkina Faso and Chad and Mauritania 
um, and Niger. And what they're trying to do collectively under Malian general is to develop the capacity to beat back some of the forces of instability. But you've got very weak governments. You've got desertification, which is disrupting populations. Population growth is very high. There's a mix, a poisonous mix of instability there that the African Union is concerned about, that the UN is concerned about, that ECOWAS is concerned about. And this military force has about $500 million a year in an overall budget. The US, European Union, African states, some Middle East states uh, contribute to that funding. And we hope it succeeds, but it's only been in business for 10 months now. It's had one big initiative, and it's very new, but it is an African-led initiative. What I would like to see is the Chinese, the Americans, and the Europeans all supporting the African instructions as to what they, the Africans, need in that region most. Mm. You talk about a very important issue on the continent being security, and hence Ghana, perhaps one of the reasons why they've entered into this cooperation with the United States. Is this, though, what we need on the continent? Well, it's one of the things you need. I mean, Lindiwi Sisulu, our Minister of International Cooperation, just said at the SADC Summit last week that peace and security is a precondition for development and integration. The African Union and its Charter Constitutive Act and its other documentations makes the same point as they did endorse this move as well. What you really need is responsible partners. Where the Americans are so out to lunch right now is that under Donald Trump, they're nowhere to be found. And all they're concerned about is, is, is smacking down terrorists, which even the military says, we can't do that. We can do it, but you won't consolidate anything without diplomacy, without political partnerships, without working with host governments in constructive ways. And the US has just completely abrogated all of those op operations and, op and, and engagements in diplomatic and foreign policy terms so that programs in, in economic cooperation and in agriculture and, uh, and, and, and energy are floundering right now because there's no leadership. Under the free trade agreement, we're also looking at the free movement of uh, persons, which governments need to handle carefully in terms of uh, security. How do they go about achieving that? Well, it's going to be very long and very difficult. And what I hope, by the way, is that South Africa reasserts in its very low-key way the leadership that it showed under Thabo and Becky when the African Renaissance was in full bloom and the African Union was trying to show that they're no longer indifferent to the internal affairs of member states. All member states now need to conduct elections. They're all observed by the African Union with help from organizations like the Electoral Institute down here in South Africa. And that's all very positive, but it's a long-term process. And if you have the kind of uh, intrusion of, of, of volatile groups like Boko Haram or El Shabaab, Bob disrupting stability and confidence of people so that they're not secure in their homes, then it's hard to do all the rest of the stuff you want to do. And that's where we leave it. Thank you so much for a fascinating conversation. Dr. Stremlau from the Department of International Relations at Wits University. After the break, the world's last male northern white rhino is commemorated in Kenya. We'll bring you those details after this. Welcome back. Kenya's tourism minister says anyone caught in possession of ivory should be sentenced to life in prison. This as a headstone was unveiled for the world's last male northern white rhino. Mango Pua reports. The headstone at the old Pajeta Conservancy, 250 kilometers north of Nairobi, commemorates the last male northern white rhinoceros, who was named Sedan. He was put down at the age of 45 last month because of his failing health. Kenya's tourism minister, Najib Balala, was present at the conservancy to unveil the headstone. He declared that ivory belonged to elephants and rhinos rather than humans. We are very clear. As government, punitive measures must be taken into punishing people who kill our wildlife. And that's why we are pushing for life sentences for people who kill for ivory because ivory belongs to elephants and rhinos better than preserving uh, taking it for human consumption. While thousands of southern white rhinos still roam sub-Saharan Africa, poaching has effectively destroyed the northern species. Sudan is survived by the last two females of his species, his 27-year-old daughter Najin and 17-year-old granddaughter Fatu. The only hope for preserving their species is through in vitro fertilization. 
Um, you know, we've recently seen the banning of uh, ivory, the ivory, ivory trade in China. That's a big step. Um, obviously, it needs to happen with enforcement and it needs to happen across the world, not just in China, because China is not the only consumer of ivory. Um, we haven't yet reached the same stage with uh, rhino horn. We have some way to go on that. Um, but, you know, these are all progressive steps, so they all help. Kenya had 20,000 rhino in the 1970s, falling to 400 in the 1990s. It now has 650, almost all of them black rhino. Mangopur, Johannesburg. Let's take a look at stories that have been trending on social media this week. Kenyans have been startled by a giant crack that has opened up across parts of the country. Scientists say it's a reminder East Africa is slowly splitting away from the rest of the continent. They say it'll take millions of years, though. Microsoft founder Bill Gates says Nigeria is a powerhouse economy that will drive future growth on the continent. His foundation has spent over a billion dollars in the country, aimed mostly at developing jobs among young people. And supermodel Noemi Campbell was one of many celebrities paying tribute to Mamui Nima Digizela Mandela, who passed away this past week. Campbell met Winnie Mandela several times. And staying with supermodel Naomi Campbell, she says U.S. and European designers should pay more attention to the continent's contribution to the global fashion industry. She, along with many of Africa's best designers, have been attending one of the continent's most prestigious fashion shows in Nigeria. Naomi Campbell was appearing at the Arise Fashion Week. The event has made a comeback after a six-year hiatus. It showcases the couture of 45 designers from 14 countries, including Tanzania, Nigeria, South Africa, Uganda, the UK, and the US, among others. Africa's never had the opportunity to be able to have and be out there and their fabrics and their materials and their designs be accepted on the global platform like the other countries. And now I think it's about to change, and it should be like that. It shouldn't be that way. It should be like everyone else. Now, the good thing is, like, African music, we are not being respected for our culture. We are not being ambassadors to promote the richness of our culture, the, color, the amount of colors we have within our environment. And we've taken it to another level. We've mixed it with a bit of European culture. And I must say I'm extremely proud of what some of our season designers have done over time. Some of them are now globally known. There are new ones coming up. They still have a long way to go. But like their predecessors before them, they would in another couple of years too would also excel. It is taking Africa to the world uh, by uh, bringing different uh, people who work with designers internationally, like international stylists, international models, international media, uh, to come through and check local designers. And that really is um, helping us to move forward and taking our brands uh, international. The top designers will go on to participate in New York Fashion Week. Arise, the synonym for Africa Rising, was first held in Lagos 11 years ago to help put Nigeria firmly on the global fashion scene. And that's it from us for now. Do stay tuned to ENCA for all the latest news. Take care and goodbye.